All right, go ahead. Hi, everybody. This is Alex from the Astro Imaging Channel. And we're here tonight to discuss um, astro imaging. And, and particularly, uh, we've got a whole bunch of us in the room here. Um, and we've been talking about ethics again. And um, I don't know what state my computer is in right now because in the last second, I completely changed things. But let me go back to here and start presenting and uh, my entire screen. You're gonna have to stop sharing there, Tim. If you sure. are sharing, or am I just, is that just me? Okay, and then now you should see the uh, Astro Imaging Channel website. Uh, am I showing the Astro Imaging Channel website properly? Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. okay, good. Okay, a couple of things we gotta point out to you. First off, um, uh, you can still get uh, get to go to get gorgeous galaxies. We've gotten some more um, uh, uh, offerings this week. Uh, we still have lots to go. Of course, we've got lots of time to get there. We've got till June 30th. Please send in your favorite galaxies. Um, make them big enough. A Canadian on one side should be sufficient, bigger if you like, uh, because we need a certain size to make the movie. When you get there, remember, you can, you can also... Uh, Look up our previous efforts, Neo Wise on Parade, and Orion Time is sitting right there. And we could still use some help putting this together. We've got a couple of volunteers, but we could use a few more. So you go ahead and click that for the volunteer button. Also, on our website, you got the calendar. And I want you to look at the calendar because tonight we've got Bob Buckheim. Bob's been here before. He does um, scientific imaging with his amateur equipment, and he's presented several shows on that topic alone. But tonight he's going to be talking about a personal endeavor where he built the Lost Gold Observatory. And uh, so he's going to tell us all about that, and we'll be able to ask him questions and things like that. Uh, we've got Warren coming in a couple of weeks and some various other um, opportunities. You'll notice that we've got Sunday, May 30th is empty and Sunday, June 20th is empty. And the 4th of July, we're going to take off. If you want to help us fill those empty spots, hit the contact button there. Tell us who you are and, and tell us what your email is and tell us um, what you want to talk about. Okay, and you tell us that kind of stuff. We'll check you out a little bit and talk to you about what you're doing and, and that and probably schedule you. We've been very fortunate lately that you guys are coming through and helping us um, get more um, uh, get more individual effort in here. This Astro Imaging Channel thing that we do is, um, it, you know, it's for you as well as for us. We want everybody to be involved in it, but we need your help doing that. Getting presenters is the hardest thing we can do. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Where am I going next? Um, okay. The next thing I want to show you is, nope, that's not it. Um, I think this is where my, there we go. That's Bob's going to be talking about this. Stop that. Okay, you notice that the over in the um, imaging, uh, over in the comments section over here, we've got um, uh, uh, the Astro Imaging Channel, that's me tonight, um, it has a link up here where you can go take our ethics survey. Now, this is not meant to be a scientific survey, which is what discombobulated me at the beginning of the show, because we were arguing about how scientific the survey is. Tim put it together for us on ideas that we all had. And here's a bunch of questions that we want to ask that we know come up on a regular basis. We actually think that most of these things are pretty well resolved, that, that we all pretty much have the same agreement on what the answers are. But we want to we want to have a conversation with you. So at some point today. Uh, oops, where am I? There we go. At some point today during the show or after the show, click on this link right here that I'm pointing to, the first comment in our questions, and just take that quick survey. We're going to use it next week because um, our calendar says we're going to talk about art, authenticity, and ethics in astroimaging. This was a topic that was suggested by one of our listeners, and uh, we think it's, it's worthwhile uh, having the conversation. 
I also suggested someplace by another um, um, one of you was that we have a program on um, uh, um, using free uh, software like GIMP and Deep Sky Stacker. We've had many programs on Photoshop and on PixInsight, but we've never really sat down with what a lot of beginners are using, GIMP and Deep Sky Stacker. If anybody out there has some expertise, not even expertise, just you're competent enough and you wouldn't mind putting together a little program where you show us how you're gonna process a stack of data through Deep Sky Stacker and then take it into GIMP and show us how to use GIMP, we would really appreciate you volunteering to do that. Again, hit the contact button and go back and do that. I think we've got everything covered. Don't forget when you're over in the uh, chat room over here to put a red question mark when you're going to ask a question uh, so that we can find it. Otherwise, enjoy yourself this evening. I'm going to turn it over to Bob. Bob, you ready to take over? You're going to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, and tell us about um, your building the observatory, okay? Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much, Alex, for inviting me to show off my backyard observatory. Share slideshow, which is shown here in all its glory. Are you seeing it? I don't yeah, hear anything. Um, there we go. Now I see it. Okay, so great. It takes us a second to, to hit our unmute buttons. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, uh, pleasure to be here. And for those of you in the audience, this is uh, mostly just a light entertainment, uh, no, no science involved. But I'll point out a few tips and lessons that I learned uh, in doing this project that might be useful to you if you embark on a similar journey. Um, when I retired, uh, Eileen and I decided that we wanted to move someplace that was a bit more rural uh, than our coastal home in Orange County, California. Uh, and uh, so that would include, of course, uh, an observatory in the backyard. And as you can see, it may be just a tad extravagant, but the theory was this is the house we die in. So there's, there's no point in being too worried about the money. Um, it started when uh, we uh, uh, decided to land in the beautiful community of Gold Canyon, Arizona, uh, right uh, next to the uh, Superstition Mountains where the Lost Dutchman gold mine is reported to be hiding somewhere. Uh, so the, the one house uh, in the neighborhood that looked like it would work for us uh, was uh, this one shown in Google View. Uh, and uh, the uh, concept was that the observatory would go right here. Uh, two points about the property. Uh, number one is we're right on the golf course. Uh, that's the uh, cart path down at the bottom uh, part of the screen. And you can barely see the road up at the top part of the picture. It's uh, close to 100 feet from the road to the backyard, and there really is no access for equipment into the backyard. That'll become important in a little while. Um, when we were living in Southern California, I had this uh, little uh, observatory based on a dome by Sirius Observatories, worked really well, had a good time. Uh, and uh, the number one design criterion was uh, my wife said, if we're going to have an observatory, it has to look like an observatory. So there would be no roll off roofs, uh, it will be a dome. The idea uh, for uh, Arizona was I wanted a larger telescope and uh, I wanted a German equatorial mount instead of a fork mount. So that meant I needed a larger dome than the seven foot uh, Sirius Observatory I had in California. Uh, I wanted it to be more comfortable to have visitors, uh, neighbors, students, et cetera, in to work on projects. Uh, the nature of the property layout demands that the observatory be a two-story affair so that uh, the observatory itself can be up above the house and get a good view all the way around. Um, I had uh, done some layouts where getting up to that second story would be sort of a ship's ladder and trap door affair. Uh, and my wife uh, put an absolute prohibition on that. Uh, 
uh, on the theory that when it's dark and I'm tired, uh, she didn't want me taking a header through the trap door. Uh, she was absolutely right about that, but it did mean the dome had to get yet a little larger in order to fit an interior stairway in there. Um, had um, uh, an architect build up, uh, do up plans for two reasons. One was to keep the county happy, but more importantly uh, was to uh, deal with the homeowners association. Uh, if you're going to do a project like this, if you're looking at buying a house in an HOA, um, I went and talked to the HOA before we bought the house about this idea. Uh, several other communities that we considered, uh, I was told, don't even bother presenting plans. It will never be approved. Um, uh, here at uh, the Superstition Mountain Golf Club, uh, the attitude was quite a bit different. They, uh, they said, this, this looks really neat. Uh, and uh, if there's anything we can do to help, let us know. Uh, also, in the purchase contract for the house, uh, I added a clause that said, uh, we'll, uh, we're committing to the purchase, but if the HOA turns down the observatory, the deal is off and the purchase is canceled, uh, which gave everybody a little more incentive, I think, to, uh, to approve the concept. So that done, uh, the first thing to do is to knock out the little walled garden where the um, observatory is going to go. Uh, to turn it into this uh, and then start uh, prepping the ground. The uh, base under the pillar that holds the telescope is roughly a five foot cube uh, whose uh, top surface is about two feet below ground level. So there was a lot of digging involved. Uh, and uh, because of that hundred foot run to the street, uh, the uh, concrete uh, we talked about piping it in, but uh, it was really on a, uh, impractical. There would be more uh, concrete in the hose than there was in the job. And then you need to provide a way for the uh, pumper to clean out the hose. So instead, uh, my contractor uh, had guys and wheelbarrows and <laughs> trundled it from the, from the uh, mixer out on the, on the street into the backyard, uh, fix up the, uh, the rebar. And uh, you can see his caterpillar in the back turned out to be a really handy piece of equipment, both for doing the digging uh, and for uh, lifting the sauna tube to get it over the rebar, uh, set her down and do. Now, the challenge is how do you get that uh, sauna tube full of concrete? Uh, same deal. Uh, cement truck uh, shows up on the street and a handful of guys show up with wheelbarrows. And uh, the um, uh, Caterpillar has a man lift on it. And so uh, check that out. Uh, the uh, uh, first wheelbarrow full of concrete will be coming through uh, the side yard in a moment. And here it comes. The guy running the Caterpillar lifts it up, pour a wheelbarrow load in. Here comes the next one. And, and that went on for, um, I think, a couple of hours, uh, up and down, pour, up, pour, down, uh, until finally uh, we were ready for the last load. There it is going in, uh, pat down a little on top. We, we did a fair amount of pounding on the sauna tube and stirring it on the way up to make sure there were no bubbles in it. And then here comes the uh, form with the J-bolts that'll hold the uh, telescope pier. Uh, and uh, and there she is. Uh, did the uh, the rest of the uh, foundation and flooring, uh, and then uh, framing is you know normal uh, uh, framing just like a house, although with a few wrinkles to make the the holes for the, uh, the concrete pillar and the uh, uh, rounded stairway. Uh, there she is, ready to go. And then the dome arrived. Uh, it's a 15-foot pro dome, uh, shows up uh, in a container that's about an 8-foot cube, weighs about 1,000 pounds. Um, and they didn't bring a forklift with them. They, they just brought this tilt truck, uh, pulled it, backed it into the driveway, uh, slid the, uh, the crate off, and uh, uh, gently drove away, and, and there it was. Uh, and then uh, my contractor uh, used his caterpillar to get it around to the backyard. And um, 
uh, here's uh, another lesson I learned. Uh, I didn't know very many people in Arizona, uh, but uh, I knew of two of the local astronomy clubs. And uh, so I uh, went to the clubs and gave a, a little presentation about uh, what, uh, what I'm doing and my desperate need for labor uh, to put this uh, prodome together. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the amateur astronomy community is, is a wonderful, friendly community. And, and I had, uh, every day that, uh, I needed work, I had at least a half a dozen guys, uh, working all day and it turned out to be in the middle of summer. So it was plenty hot, uh, for, uh, the thrill of putting the dome together and, uh, staying fully stocked with donuts and lunch. So this is the uh, the base ring that the dome will rotate on. You can see the little rollers and the motors that drive the the dome around when it's set it on there. Uh, here we are figuring out how to assemble the dome, which comes in four quadrants of uh, roughly eighth inch uh, fiberglass uh, that has to be uh, uh, assembled and bolted together. Uh, it entails uh, a whole lot of match drilling to get the holes in the right place. Uh, some of the techniques we used, like uh, close your eyes and drill, are probably not OSHA approved. Uh, and then uh, when the holes are drilled, there's a whole lot of uh, bolting and screwing together. Uh, and after the, the two halves were assembled, uh, we uh, drilled a few extra holes to uh, put uh, two by fours to uh, hold a, and balance the uh, the shell and uh, use the uh, crane lift on the caterpillar to get it up on the roof. Here comes the uh, the second half. Uh, you, it turns out you just you sit it down and sort of nestle it into place so that the the dome is now resting on its rollers. Uh, and then the uh, the rear cover holds the the back half together. Uh, also entails a fair amount of bolting and screwing, probably, not, again, not an OSHA-approved method of operating. Uh, and then uh, the spacers here hold the, uh, the dome in the right position uh, while you get the, uh, the shutter, which is a two-piece shutter arrangement on the uh, pro-dome, uh, into place. And uh, with that all done, uh, by golly, there's an observatory in the backyard. Uh, that uh, the whole deal, the construction, I think, took uh, maybe three months to get the building ready and uh, getting the dome uh, assembled and uh, put up on the roof was, I think, a couple of weekends. It was not a uh, a gigantic job. Here's what it looks like downstairs, now all done. Uh, we uh, talked about what kind of flooring to have downstairs. And I said, well, why don't we just put uh, one of those epoxy coat uh, floorings like you'd put in your garage. Uh, and it'll be clean and easy to, to keep clean and uh, put it on the stairs too. And I didn't realize till I got back that afternoon uh, that you could put that epoxy coat on a vertical surface. Uh, so the epoxy coat on the pier over on the on the right hand side uh, really looks a lot nicer and cleaner than bare concrete. Um, equipment: uh, the telescope up on top of that pillar uh, is uh, on a a uh, an iron uh, pillar that that's about three feet tall, and on top of that is a Paramount ME that I got used. Uh, from a friend of mine, uh, the Paramount's a, uh, a wonderful piece of machinery and software BISC is wonderful to work with. Uh, since it was a used mount, they sent uh, the shipping crate to my friend Jerry, uh, who had the mount. He put it in there, shipped it back to their factory where they uh, did a clean refurb and check out. Uh, they had to charge me a little extra because they uh, had to clean out a a uh, fair number of rats' nests and uh, rat bathrooms that had been inside the mount. Uh, but then they sent it to me in uh, like new condition. Uh, the telescope that you saw in the opening picture is a TPO 16-inch uh, RC. Um, it's not a plane wave, but it uh, it's a fine instrument for uh, what I use it for and is a great value. They were, uh, uh, when I bought it, they were having a sale uh, it was, I think, $5,000 plus they paid the sales tax and no charge for shipping. Uh, 
Um, one thing, if uh, those of you who are used to Schmidt Cass uh, telescopes, as I was, uh, you know, you get uh, sort of blase about back focus because you can focus anything on a Schmidt Cass. Uh, RCs have a fixed focal plane. It is by golly 11 inches from the back surface of the telescope. Uh, and so you need, in addition to a focuser, you need custom spacers to put whatever your instrument is at the right place. Um, I've uh, got an Optec focuser, which I love, uh, but it's only got a throw of uh, plus or minus about three tenths of an inch. So you need custom spacers to put everything within uh, uh, better than a half inch of uh, the desired location. Bob, uh, T you have, you have Yo. time for a question before you move on. Could you back up one slide? Yeah. So is the pillar, gray gas, is the pillar isolated from the rest of the structure? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a one inch gap between the, uh, the floor concrete and the pillar uh, filled up with a sort of rubberized something. Uh, and then, of course, there's also a, a gap uh, where the second story floor is uh, about an inch. So the floor doesn't contact the, uh, the pillar. OK, thanks. Uh, also, um, uh, the one thing, of course, the architect had no clue what the requirements for the pillar were. So I dredged up uh, Rourke's uh, handbook of um, uh, structures. And uh, it's a 24 inch. Uh, diameter concrete pillar with, I think, 12 strands of rebar inside. Uh, I picked 24 inch because if you push on the top side with about 20 pounds of force, the top surface will rotate by about one arc second. So it's, it's stiff and stable. Uh, natural frequency is somewhere between 25 and 30 hertz. It's it's really stiff and it's not going anywhere. Um, no, I was talking about custom spacers. Now, uh, TPO only makes them in one inch and two inch um, lengths, so that's not sufficient. So you make friends with your local machine shop and, uh, and they'll make custom spacers for you, uh, whatever you need. Uh, the Optech TCFS focuser is uh, is great. It's been uh, trouble free. The only thing I regret is um, that I know that someday I'm going to want a rotator, and I should have just bought that in the beginning. Uh, the uh, instruments that I use are a um, uh, a venerable S big ST8 CCD. Uh, that I use for uh, photometry and occasionally for imaging, but I'm, I'm a terrible imager. Um, uh, it must be 15 years old now, and it's been a real workhorse and trouble-free. Uh, and for spectroscopy, a couple of three months ago, I told you about uh, astronomical spectroscopy with a small telescope uh, and described the ALPI spectrograph that I'm using. Uh, it's well-designed, it's rugged and reliable. Uh, it uses an uh, ATIC 314 uh, science camera and an S big STI guide camera. Um, and, you know, just like aperture fever, I'm now lusting after uh, spectral resolution fever. So there's probably a new spectrograph in the future in the next year or so. The entire observatory uh, runs on the Sky X Pro. Uh, I didn't have any experience with Sky X uh, before this, but of course it comes uh, as part of the package with a Paramount. Um, I don't know if if I would recommend buying it just for you know, any running any mount in any observatory you have, but it's a great integrated tool for uh, uh, for what I have there with the Paramount, and it runs the mount, it runs the dome, it runs the cameras. Uh, uh, runs the focuser uh, all in one clean package. And uh, I had originally had an old um, uh, regular laptop, uh, desktop kind of a computer running everything. Uh, but a friend of mine turned me on to these uh, mini boxes that Minix computer, uh, including a Windows 10 operating system is about 300 bucks. Uh, it's about the size of a paperback book. Uh, and it runs the whole affair. Uh, it's quiet, it's small, it's out of the way. 
Uh, in fact, it's uh, I've got it zip tied to the, um, uh, the the safety fence uh, upstairs in the observatory that you saw in the uh, opening photo. Um, uh, for guiding the spectrograph, uh, PhD2 guide is is great with some features uh, that are particularly handy uh, for spectroscopy. Uh, it puts a synthetic spectrograph slit onto the guide image. And uh, and with the paramount for photometry, I, I don't need to guide. I can do five minute images with uh, uh, with uh, no problem on the paramount. Uh, Prodome uh, 15, uh, it is working. As you can see, I'm only giving it a C grade because it is uh, satisfactory, uh, but uh, I'd say not great. And I'll describe that on uh, uh, the upcoming slides. And uh, the digital dome works uh, that's integrated with it uh, plays uh, nicely with the sky through a third party app, through a technology that I don't exactly know what it is, but it's called an X2 driver software. Uh, it, it works is all I know. Um, now, why does the ProDome only get a C? Uh, it, it was in fine condition when it arrived. There was no trouble with uh, shipping. In fact, uh, production ran a little ahead of schedule, uh, actually a little sooner than uh, Jerry at TI had promised it. Uh, and I showed you that there's a whole lot of bolting and tightening involved in putting a fiberglass structure together. Um, many places, the main structural fasteners are carriage bolts. Um, they're all, of course, supplied with the, uh, uh, with the, the dome package. Uh, and if you, you've probably seen these at the hardware store, if you haven't used them, they, uh, they have a kind of a square end to the shank. Uh, that uh, in theory, uh, as you tighten the bolt, uh, that square shank is pulled into the fiberglass and with a square hole, it's locked in place. Um, yeah, that's a great theory, but uh, fiberglass, uh, it tears. Uh, and so once you've uh, tightened something about three quarters of the way in and it tears the fiberglass, you cannot tighten the bolt anymore but you also can't get it out because there's no slot in the head of a carriage bolt. So the first time that happened to me, I threw all those carriage bolts away and uh, called Granger and uh, replaced all of them with socket head cap screws so that uh, I could deal with uh, the occasional misdrilled hole and uh, uh, be able to uh, remove the bolt if necessary. Uh, not a big deal, but it turned out it added up to about 150 bucks worth of stainless steel screws. Um, you saw this uh, picture when we were assembling uh, two halves or two quadrants into one half of the dome. Uh, now the theory is uh, that um, in the in the area shown in the in the little red oval, the theory is that there's a there's a vertical flange that will come together, and then you tighten uh, the the bolts down where the where the two pieces join. The theory is that that's going to be flush, as shown in the little sketch here, because uh, a little uh, carrier that runs the um, uh, the slit of the dome has to pass over that joint. Uh, problem is, eighth-inch fiberglass is not at all stiff, and so what actually happens uh, when you uh, when you assemble this is you get a little overlap and a little lip step kind of a thing that that shuttle carrier has to go over and that's it just doesn't work and i couldn't figure out uh, any way to avoid that uh, defect in assembly so uh, after everything was together i went back to the, the local machine shop and had to make me a, a couple of custom wedges uh, to uh, bridge that step uh, so that the the little sliding carrier uh, has a smooth wedge to go over rather than a, have to make a, a jump going uphill. Uh, works fine, not a big deal. Uh, a little disappointed that uh, that I needed to do that. Um, the the drive mechanism that uh, opens and closes the shutter. The shutter slides over uh, and back closed. Uh, it's driven by a uh, wire rope uh, cable system. Uh, in the picture up at the top right, uh, you, if my mouse shows, you see this is the, the motor drive thing. There's a couple of drive shivs in here behind the front of the telescope that 
move these cables. Uh, and uh, it works great. It's a very powerful system. Uh, it, it can handle more uh, than the uh, shutter will uh, ask it to do. But note the angle of this cable coming in to this roller where it has to make a 90 degree turn. Um, in, in the parlance of uh, wire rope drives, that's called the fleet angle something that I learned in troubleshooting this. Um, the, the way that the motor drive is designed and the, um, uh, the rollers are put into the inside of the dome, um, the, the fleet angle at which this cable comes into that roller is more than five degrees. All of the specs in the wire rope world say uh, that fleet angle should be no more than one to one and a half degrees, uh, depending on the specific application, to prevent what they call excessive wear and damage. And man alive, they're not kidding. Uh, at a five inch angle, uh, that wire rope was fraying and dropping little pieces of stainless steel onto the floor within a couple of months. Um, not at all a, uh, a reliable approach, strictly because of that angle problem. So I, I figured out a way to uh, put that uh, this uh, roller on an angle that wire now comes into it at a fleet angle of approximately zero. Uh, that addressed the problem of damaging the wire rope. Uh, the mechanism that drives the cable is, is a, a couple of rotating shivs. And um, as the, as the uh, shutter, particularly when it's closing, it reaches certain points where there's such a strong pull that something is stretching. Uh, and you get a little slack on the undriven side of the cable, which occasionally, you know, maybe once every three or four months will result in a little fouling and tangling of the cable on the drive mechanism. Uh, if you're out there and, and, and you're closing it uh, by putting your finger on the, on the button to drive the motor, not a problem. You see it happening. Uh, you can stop, get on a step stool and, and you know, fix the little problem before it's a disaster. Uh, but I would never trust this shutter drive mechanism, mechanism in a totally remote uh, operation, never in a million years. Um, part of the problem, I think, uh, is that a large cantilevered fiberglass structure like this is, um, is not very strong and it sags uh, in uh, uh, pretty noticeably. Uh, you remember this picture when we were uh, doing the uh, final assembly of the dome and bolting the uh, dome down to the uh, uh, the ring that sits on the rollers. Uh, the instructions say to put these 48 inch uh, plus or minus an eighth uh, two by fours in there to hold the slit in the right position while you're tightening. Uh, after we had done that, and after the, the base was all tightened down, uh, I was surprised to discover that we couldn't get those two by fours out. Uh, we finally had to whack them with a mallet to loosen them up enough because there was so much pressure holding them in. Uh, and the reason is when you take them out, that entire uh, opening uh, sags inward by anywhere from one to three inches, depending on where you measure it. Um, that means that the, the, as you're opening and closing the shutter, there's this slide mechanism on the inside. In addition to lifting the weight of the shutter and overcoming the friction, uh, it needs to open up the, uh, the dome by a couple inches. As I mentioned, it's a really powerful drive mechanism uh, and uh, has no trouble doing that. But uh, I, I was surprised at how flexible the dome is uh, in this situation. Um, uh, there, there seems to be a, a, a chronic, you know, little drips and, and weeps uh, from rain. Uh, the, uh, the dome is, of course, a whole bunch of pieces uh, bolted together, and uh, waterproofing it relies totally on uh, the caulking on the exterior. Uh, Arizona sun, 
uh, the flexibility of the dome, something means that, you know, every year I need to do a little touch up on the caulking. Um, now, this is a 15 foot dome. It's pretty big. Um, I know some people who have 10 foot pro domes and they're very happy with them and they found them to be very reliable. So I, I don't want it to sound like I'm bad mouthing the product. Uh, Jerry at, uh, at TI uh, has, has been wonderful about uh, trying to help with any little problems I had, prompted uh, answering questions and providing uh, additional parts when I needed them. Uh, I think that the deal is that 15 foot is just a little too large for the design concept and the materials. Um, so uh, we were talking before the meeting started about big domes. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you, if you pay double or maybe two and a half times what the pro dome costs, you can get an ash dome. Uh, you know, if you're operating remotely, I would strongly encourage you to do that. Um, this is in my backyard. I, I operate it from a, a control desk inside there. So uh, I, uh, it's not a problem for me. Uh, uh, Bob, yo. Uh, another question. Actually, going back to your pillar, the question was, high stiffness means high resonance frequency. Why only 25 hertz? Yeah, it turns out um, uh, uh, taking something that is uh, 12 feet tall and, and giving it a higher resonant frequency than that uh, is really, really difficult. Um, one of the telescope uh, or the observatory um, construction companies whose name I, I don't remember, it might've been Observatory Solutions, uh, on their website describes the specs that they work to and they aim for uh, 30 Hertz resonant frequency. Uh, part of it probably is that um, you're, well, I guess I don't know where that comes from, but I followed their guidance. That answer the question or does yep. it raise more? Uh, well, if we have any more questions, we'll <laughs> put them out there. Yes, it seemed to answer the question. Okay, Go cool. Um, the you saw the curved staircase in the picture. Uh, it works out great. It's uh, it's not only uh, convenient and easy, but it's sort of dramatic when the neighbors come over to do a little stargazing to 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 walk up the curved stairway onto the observing deck, and the uh, the wrought iron safety fence and a spring-loaded gate at the top of the stairs so that no matter how tired I get, I can't uh, take a tumble down the stairs in the middle of the night uh, has, uh, has been great. The, um, the flooring upstairs uh, on the observing deck is uh, about a, I think it's a half inch thick rubber uh, flooring mat like you might find in a gym. Uh, in the weightlifting room. Um, uh, it, it, not only is it inexpensive, but it's nice and soft on your feet. And when you drop something, it's nice and soft. So probably the thing will still be usable when you pick it back up. Uh, the one thing I have noticed though, is when you drop a small screw, like a little 632 bolt, uh, it'll bounce a long way off that rubber matting. Uh, electrical outlets upstairs there. Uh, there's eight outlets at the base of the pier, uh, four near the operator's desk, and uh, four on the north wall. And uh, finally, I have enough electrical outlets uh, that uh, they're not all uh, full and on power strips. Uh, the epoxy coating downstairs you saw, uh, it's worked out great. It really is nice and clean and attractive. Uh, you, uh, if you saw on the on the uh, title slide, the silver lining on the inside of the dome, um, that's uh, that uh, aluminized bubble wrap uh, kind of radiation barrier. Um, you know, I'm in in Arizona, southeast of Phoenix. Uh, it gets nice and warm here in the summer, uh, and the sun beating down on the uh, on the dome, uh, it gets pretty darn hot on the inside. Uh, the radiation barrier helps, and I keep a uh, portable air conditioner blowing cool air at the telescope and the equipment. Uh, there's no point in trying to cool the air inside the, um, the dome. I just want to keep the equipment cool so it's at roughly the right temperature uh, for uh, nighttime when we open the dome. 
and the right temperature depends on the time of year. In the winter here, uh, it will literally be freezing or maybe a little bit below. Uh, in the summertime, I've been outside in the observatory at midnight when it's still 100 degrees. Um, so fiber, uh, uh, carbon fiber uh, struts on the uh, telescope uh, are handy to avoid uh, focus problems. Um, so that's uh, my prepared remarks. Uh, any uh, further yeah. questions or discussion? Yeah. A couple questions came up in the last minute. Uh, with the rubber matting on there, any problems with static or static discharge? Um, I haven't seen any. One of my friends told me that that was a common issue. Um, I I haven't had any. Of course, it's not in contact with uh, any of the wiring or uh, uh, or any of the uh, telescope equipment. So uh, I haven't seen any, but there might very well be some. Of course, the humidity here is usually about zero anyhow. So static electricity is not unusual. And another question uh, is probably a, a big difference between inside and outside temperatures when you open up. Uh, any consideration for turbulence induced by the, you know, the heat ventilating out? Yeah, you know, it's um, uh, I'm worried about that a little, uh, but uh, on the other hand, there's not much I could do about it. The um, the dome itself has like zero heat capacity. You know, it's eighth inch fiberglass. Uh, once the sun goes down. Uh, it it is equilibrated to the outside air temperature, you know, within certainly within a half hour. Um, interestingly, uh, downstairs, even in the heat of summer, uh, when I'm when I'm observing, of course, I open the dome and I open the two windows down there, so there's uh, airflow uh, going every which way, and uh, so the whole place. Uh, comes to uh, outside ambient temperature very quickly, within an hour. Um, I haven't seen any evidence of uh, dome currents or, or anything like that. And amazingly then, uh, the coolest part of the uh, diurnal cycle uh, here is uh, dawn. And so that's about when I'm closing up the observatory, I close the windows downstairs. And for some reason, uh, amazingly, it stays cool downstairs all day. Uh, so it's, um, you know, it's not like there's hot air downstairs to be blown out. Uh, there's, your air is ventilating, but you have a lot of heat capacity in all of your equipment and everything yeah. else, which gets warm and that takes a while to cool down, doesn't it? Yeah, well, and that's why uh, the portable air conditioner is blowing at the telescope all day. Uh, I usually put it under a um, uh, one of those um, aluminum emergency blankets and uh, yeah, and it, I haven't had a problem. Uh, kind of amazing. I, I expected uh, a little more trouble with uh, heat and focusing, but uh, I haven't seen it. And the last posted question was, uh, how difficult was it to educate your contractor about what you do and how things have to be done? Um, not not too hard. Uh, his uh, uh, One of his virtues uh, is that he's willing to try anything. Um, and, and of course, from the standpoint of building the structure, um, you know, it's, you know, just like building a little outhouse or a casita, you know, it's regular, uh, you know, two by sixes and things like that. Um, the, um, uh, he was a little mystified by the uh, the pillar, but, uh, you know, he, he saw what I wanted to do and he did it per print. Uh, funny thing is uh, uh, just down the street from me, uh, a fellow uh, had built his house and included an observatory in it. Uh, and uh, Clint, uh, my contractor, did the house and observatory for him also. So Clint may have a little sideline of being the... Uh, uh, Pinal County Observatory uh, construction uh, expert now. Uh, another question that I have, your focal length is about 35, 3600 millimeters. That's an F9, 16? Uh, it's F8, but yeah, 3500 30, millimeters, yeah. 3500. And if you're imaging and guiding in the Milky Way, it's no problem uh, coming up with a guide star. But if you're not, you're doing some galaxy, then of course you have an issue, especially without the rotator. So how do you how do you position it? What what software do you use in order to set up your your field of view and then a, have a guide star 
guide star in your your guide camera? Well, um, for uh, imaging or photometry, I don't guide. Uh, the Paramount is, uh, with a good model, is uh, accurate enough. I can take a five-minute image or series of them all night, and maybe you know one out of twenty I have to throw out for some reason. Uh, so I don't guide uh, when I'm imaging. Uh, when I'm doing spectroscopy, uh, the demand on tracking is uh, is a lot more stringent. The slit in the spectrograph is about uh, three arc seconds wide and so you need to keep your star in there but in that case uh mostly i'm guiding on the target star uh, so it's right on axis and john has a question custom peer or standard vendor supplied i'm not quite uh, sure what the, the question is but oh he's uh he's looking at the blue uh, uh the blue peer uh underneath the uh paramount. oh i see it yeah um it's uh Iron pipe, uh, I think it's 11 inches in diameter and about a half inch wall thickness. Um, uh, when I when we moved out of California, I, this pipe uh, uh, was about six feet tall with a built-in uh, wedge on it for my uh, fork-mounted Schmidt cast. Uh, the fellow who bought the observatory was out here in Phoenix. He didn't have room in his car for the pier. Uh, so I said, well, I'll, I'll just bring it out with me when we move and, and make contact. And by the time I got here, he didn't need it anymore. So I took it to one of the local shops and had him cut it down um, into the, the height for, uh, for this use. So that's the story behind it. I hate to ask, but I think a lot of people are thinking, this probably costs as much as a house. Well, you know, the one the the one thing that that it was going in the back of my mind while while I was building and paying the bills for this was um, I know I want it and I know I'm going to love it. But the thing is, I'm spending a lot of money and probably net reducing the value of the house because nobody else is going to want this. Um, uh, it was the. Um, I'll uh, take the, it when you're done. <laughs> but you have to take the house too. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> okay. I'll make a note of that in my will to have them call you. Um, the, but uh, in the big scheme of things, uh, it, it, you know, I mean, it's obviously extravagant, but it was, I think, um, uh, uh, Clint charged, I think, $35,000 for the building. And the, the dome is 25000 round numbers. Uh, so yeah, obviously it ain't cheap, but um, uh, it's the only one like it in the neighborhood and it's probably the last one I'll ever build. And if someone buys a house when you're gone, it could be a party shed or... Yeah, I figure uh, when I'm gone, it's not my problem. The, the, the bank will have to decide what they want to do with it. <laughs> one thing is knocking the pier down is not going to be easy. <laughs> Um, Bob, I've there, got a question. Um, do you have any issues with the electrical contacts with the top half of the dome? They they use a pad system on that, don't they? Yeah, yeah. It's um, there's a, a carrier with a kind of a springy copper rings that uh, slides onto uh, these. I don't know what they're made of. Silvery contacts that takes the um, uh, the the 18 volt. DC up to the motors. Um, I have not uh, had any problems with them. Uh, you have to adjust them so that they're nicely spring contacted with the um, uh, the slider plates. And um, I somebody posted a year or so ago uh, replacing uh, the slider plates with I think actual brass plates, which sounded to me like a pretty good idea. If I ever have a corrosion problem there, I'll do that. But that part's worked okay for me. But of course, now we're in a zero. Yes, I, I've got one of these in the backyard. And that is an issue for me is that sometimes I have to just give the uh, top half a bit of a smack to get electrical contact or yeah. jog it slightly, which in a remote operation is no good. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah so I'm, it, that's another reason it might not be the best choice for a remote observatory. Yeah, I've got uh, the other one is uh, is actually a proper slippering that it runs on. 
which mm -hmm. always has power, which is a much better design. But yeah, this yeah. one, yeah, I, I get dust settling on it. And then with the humidity, and then you get a slurry. And that's enough, just enough to rise that little crazy uh, bit of brass that they have there not to make contact reliably. Yeah, I, I, I can believe that. Yeah, I have to brush mine off every few days from the, just dust getting on it. Um, Bob, could you address uh, to in a little more depth um, the issue? Linda, um, Linda wants to know, how difficult was it to educate your contractor on observatory-specific considerations? Yeah, he had a little practice on somebody else's observatory, but... Uh, oh, no, mine, mine actually was the practice case. Um, well, I, yeah. knew, I knew what I wanted, and, and you know, I told him things like you know, isolating the pier from the, the flooring and uh, both downstairs and upstairs. Uh, and, uh, you know, he saluted smartly and said, yes, sir. Okay. So he picked it up pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, what, yeah. I, what, I have, what I have seen with other people they complain that the contractor says, look, I know a better way to do that. And they go ahead and do it. And you've got to be very careful because while they may know a better way to put in a, a, a pier or a foundation, they don't know about telescope piers, which are different than the one that holds up a roof someplace. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. And uh, both the, the, the architect who did the drawings and, and the contractor uh, were both, uh, they, they sort of deferred to, to my presumed expertise and, and did what I told him was needed there. But okay. you have to be sure that you know what you, what you want and what you believe you need, and then you'll be stuck with it because they're going to do what you told them to. When, when we're looking at the picture we're looking at right now, um, is there a walkway around the observatory, around the dome? Yeah, there's a, uh, the parapet wall of the building uh, and there's a, um, a um, maybe a foot wide gap uh, between the dome and the wall on the inside. So I can get out there and uh, do exterior maintenance as needed. Okay. So there's a floor there. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's, it's that, that white rubbery stuff uh, that uh, you put on a flat roof. So do you okay. get there an annually and wax the, uh, the dome to keep the oxidation down or? Does I have haven't. Access? I okay. haven't. I probably should. Is there any way to brace that dome so the top doesn't sag in and bind your your uh, opening? Uh, I I haven't thought of any, and I haven't heard of any uh, that that will do it without you know obstructing the uh, uh, the the telescope view out. I you know I thought about trying to figure out how to attach cables to the outside and put them under tension to pull it open. And then, you know, it, it just, that seems like a Rube Goldberg. How, how, how far back can your, how far back can your telescope see? I mean, it would seem to me that you only need a slot on one side of that dome. Yeah. And in fact, as you're looking at this picture, the, the back wall uh, where the motor drive mechanism is, that's, that's fixed. Uh, the shutter opens to the zenith and then about another foot. Uh, so you can look straight up uh, with, uh, with no problem. Uh, and the, uh, the main support uh, of the dome is that back wall. Okay. Well, it would seem to me that uh, can you put something across that area to hold at least that part of it together? Well, that part uh, is is already firmly held. It's already uh, firm. It, yeah, so, it's it's so, the open part that sags a little. And 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 all that. Uh, okay, okay. That just seems like not enough to, to allow that much of a sag, since so much of the rest of it is, in fact, uh, grabbed. You know, pulled together. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's the deal. It's a it's a big structure. Uh, and it's very flexible. It even happens okay. on the six foot version. I have a six foot and I have exact problems that you have made. Interesting. All the way through. All the way through. Interesting. Yeah, so, yeah. Because I, I I did not have that on my serious observatory seven and a half footer. Hmm. Um, but the 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 shutter mechanism there was a little different, so it it probably wouldn't have I probably wouldn't have known if it was happening, but in some ways that little guy was more reliable. 
you know, the windlass system they use on here is uh, is interesting. The, the the angles that you mentioned, I was just shaking my head, going, "Yes, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about." You've been there. <laughs> oh yeah, that's per perfect, perfect. <laughs> Bob, what kind of seeing and how many clear nights do you have? Um, uh, aside from the Arizona monsoon, um, probably two thirds of the nights are uh, uh, are clear. And seeing is uh, quite variable. Um, three arc seconds, full width half max on a on a, uh, a stable night, and uh, if it's a little windy, then you know four, maybe five arc seconds on a bad night. I notice you're not using a shroud. Oh, I actually I am. Um, I, uh, this picture was taken shortly after uh, the telescope was put on, and uh, and I very quickly discovered light from the computer monitor, which you can't see, but it's over on the uh, left side of the slit, uh, was getting in. So I uh, had a local seamstress make a shroud for me. Okay, where are we? Oh, the question came in. Do you have any pictures to show us? <laughs> Actually, I do. Um, All right. This is this is my glorious galaxy, but um, it, the reason that I took this picture had nothing to do with the galaxy. Uh, mm -hmm. That little dot in it, um, which is called AT twenty nineteen ABN, appeared uh, in um, uh, early twenty nineteen. Just one, it wasn't there, and then one night it was there, and. Uh, a friend of mine got a call from a uh, astronomy researcher at U of Colorado saying, hey, can you guys do photometry on this thing? Uh, and so my friend called me and I called a couple other guys. And uh, it turned out um, it's they call it an intermediate luminosity red transient, uh, which is, you know, science for we really don't know what it is. Uh, intermediate luminosity. Um, it's brighter than a classical nova but way fainter than a supernova. So it's intermediate. Uh, and it's uh, profoundly red in color and it's a transient. It came and then it went. So uh, anyhow, the, the paper about it uh, in App J uh, includes uh, me and Woody Sims and a few other amateur astronomers because we got you know the, the green and blue lines. That's all the optical band photometry. It's almost all ours. So uh, that's that's what science projects are all about. We we got data that caused them to try to figure out what this gizmo is. Um, I don't have a picture of it, but uh, a couple of months ago, a high school kid uh, contacted me and asked if I could help her do a science fair project on exoplanets, and so. Uh, I taught her how to run the equipment, and she came over for several nights and uh, was able to get a, a transit light curve uh, on uh, WASP 33B. Uh, and you can see on the light curve, the the signal of the transit is a little more than a one percent drop in brightness, uh, and it's and it's a really clear signal here. And, um, you know, I'm still doing spectroscopy. I told you all about that a, a couple of months ago. Uh, and there's all kinds of things to be seen on uh, stars that change in the night. And, and a word from our sponsor. Don't forget the Society for Astronomical Sciences. We will be having a symposium in 2021. Uh, it will be online. And I hope this is the last year we have to do it online. Uh, but uh, meetings on June 15th, 19th, and 22nd. Uh, go to socastrosci.org to register, and you can see what other backyard scientists are doing in the dark. Wonderful. That's good. Okay. Hey, uh, Eric, we got any other questions out there? I don't see any right now. There's some uh, crosstalk there on your transient. <laughs> oh. We showed this at uh, at a local astronomy club uh, the the night that we had first started taking data, and you know we said, and this wasn't here a week ago. And a guy pulled out his phone and went through his images. He said, "You're right, it wasn't there a week ago." Cool. Okay. Um, 
Okay. All right, stop could, sharing and you get out of your way. There. And I'm going to go back to sharing for briefly. Um, do, 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 present now. My entire screen. Clickety, clickety. Thank you very much, Bob. It's always a pleasure to have you here. You do good work. Uh, I know you're you're you've taken some pretty pictures, but you're mostly into the science stuff, and and we appreciate it. And we're going to have you back, and you can tell us some more stuff we can do with our te uh, telescopes a little bit later. Um, uh, can you guys see the ethics and astroimaging questionnaire here? That's for hello. I see it. Okay. Uh, are you seeing it on the on YouTube? Um, well, no, I'm seeing yeah, it on your on screen share. Yeah, now, yeah, now we're now okay. Yeah, we're good. We're we've got a delay for those of you who are out there. And it, it, everything's a little bit delayed here, and so it's hard to tell exactly what's happening. Anyway, um, please go and fill this out. It's not science. It's not definitive. And nobody's doing their PhD study on the ethics of astroimaging. But we would like food for thought for, for um, next week. Uh, to get to it, you can go to here. This, this uh, first comment in tonight's show is about it. And um, over, uh, let's see. Nope, that's not going to get. Uh, if you go to the astroimaging channel.org and you go to the front page here for art, authenticity, and ethics survey, you click on that link down there. Okay. We would like to have as many of you participating in that as, as we can. And I think we're going to have a good show. Now, I would like, if possible, to have Tolga turn his, uh, Tolga, are you still there out there? Oh, you had to go to, oh, anyway, if you're out there, Tolga, show us what Bella made for us. I'm, I'm assuming that was Bella's artwork. Oh, yeah, yeah. Up. <laughs> it was Bella's, right? You weren't standing oh, there the it. whole time. Okay, where's your artwork? <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> I got a little here. Go. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I love it. That was Bella. Bella's is That's beautiful. Bella kid. is Tolga's kid. Okay, so we're proud of her too. Uh, she comes in and visits us and before the show starts and stuff like that. And you too can get in before the show starts if you want, but you're going to have to work at it a little bit. You're going to have to volunteer to do things now and then, and all that kind of cool stuff. We are always looking for more volunteers. This organization will not run well in the long run if it's always the same people doing always the same thing. So please jump in and help us out. Okay. I think we're done for the night. Molly, are you ready to take over? Can do. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Good night.